what we must understand as we turn to the doctrine of eschatology is that just as a good novel satisfies us for a time or deliberately frustrates us in our expectation of ending, of closure, of good judgment, of things being set right. And then so our theology drives us toward an eschatology, to an account of how things end, how things are judged ultimately. And of course, because we're talking about theology, we're talking about God's judgment. Now, in the uh, artwork you see behind me, you have a human representation of judgment day. Hieronymus Bosch, we're not going to narrate much about this uh, depiction, but you see uh, on your left the verdant green paradisal image, we suppose. Garden of Eden like state, the contemporary world perhaps in the central panel, and then once judgment is being met out on the right, the judgment of hell, equally, of course, then we go back to the left. Perhaps this is then paradise regained, order restituted, Christ reigning, as you see there in the top left, on the clouds. This is the material that we're talking about as we explore uh, ecclesiology, that, sorry, it's eschatology. From my E's, in French stuff, um, the theosuary, it's the whole gamut. Um, and there's a sense in which, okay, um, when we come to eschatology, and when we come to any theology, there is no end to the speaking that we must speak, uh, which might already make you a little nervous, because you thought you were going to get out in about 40 minutes time. Um, but the theological task is not wrapped up until when? Until the day of the Lord. Until Jesus comes. Uh, and I am convinced that Jesus may return even within this 40 minutes. And yet if he does not, the theological task continues. Um, I should, as a theologian, keep talking and talking and talking until I die. This is why some of the best uh, or press conference again, this is why some of the best theological uh, systematic theologies out there never got finished. Uh, the authors died. Um, I'm not wishing death upon Wayne Gruden or anything like that. I'm just saying um, that there's a sense in which the completeness that we give um, to theology is always an artifice. Uh, it's important that we make those closures, but it's closure in view of the fact that full, ultimate disclosure comes from God's unveiling, God's judgment. And just as we see that side of weather-wise, that heavens have opened, um, that we hope and look in Scripture to see heaven opened um, to understand what eschatology, what judgment, what the end may be about. And we do so with anticipation, eagerly. Uh, we are told that we are waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, the day of the Lord, the day in New Testament terms of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 12. We're hoping that the salvation that God has begun in us will be brought to completion. We are working out our salvation until that day. So we have that forward orientation. Nevertheless, this is a question about what is the kingdom of God. It's not just individual salvation as we've been hearing in the doctrine of the church and, and the spiritual formation. It's about community. What is the kingdom of God? God coming as king to judge. Judgment is a kingly office. It's when we say kingdom of God, we're not just talking about a constitutional arrangement so that we can suppose our churches might come approximate to the kingdom of God by having the right form of church government. No, they approximate to the king, uh, kingdom of God in that there is government, in there is judgment, that we are continually judging and also forgiving one another. So the kingdom of God is not an institutional constitutional form, but a hope in God's consistent judgment, and ultimately his final judgment that will wrap all things up. And so I want to highlight a few things for you as we think about eschatology. Uh, the first thing to say is that when we talk about eschatology, we must say that it is inaugurated. It has begun. The other ways to describe this theology, there is an already to our eschatology, as well as, on the other hand, a not yet. And understanding this is important. Um, 
biblical scholar and theologian uh, Oscar Pullman talked uh, about this in terms of the analogy of D-Day and V-E-Day. Now he was European, perhaps I should say V-J Day, yeah, but um, the sense in which on D-Day, okay, uh, as the Allied forces um, invaded Europe with overwhelming force, that was the end of the war for all intents and purposes for the Nazi uh, Axis powers. It was not, as a matter of fact, the last day of the war, the last day of conflict. But that a judgment could be made militarily, this defeat of Hitler and his powers is certain from now on in. It is wrapped up on the ego. There's a certainty about the eschatology that we live in already that nevertheless has not yet been wrapped up. There are still questions, imaginations, uh, understandings we uh, play with. There's another sense in which we uh, may divide up our thinking about eschatology, not just uh, that it is inaugurated, so there is an already and a not yet, but also eschatology can be uh, that which applies to me personally, but equally, eschatology can have a cosmic purview. It is general, it applies to all of reality. And it's important that we understand both those elements as we think through eschatology together. And the big way of asking this question is, is eschatology then good news? Is it good news? And for it to be good, I want to commend it to you to be good, but I want to focus on the news element. In what sense is eschatology news? I mean, if you get news today, that uh, someone really dear to you has uh, fallen gravely ill. You act upon that news. If you hear news today that someone really dear to you has won the lottery and wants to celebrate, uh, you act on that, you get close to them, to enjoy the party. News does that. Is eschatology good news for us? Uh, or is it just kind of future speculation? that has no bearing on today. The biblical answer must be, eschatology is good news. And that's what I want to uh, spend some time exploring with you this morning. Complete this sentence. You go to heaven when you die. It's a normal way in which we would complete that sentence. And there is uh, some clear biblical truth to that. Christ uh, is in heaven, Paul hopes that if he's not to stay and minister to the Philippians, that he would be with Christ, and that would be better. There's some truth to this. Nevertheless, heaven is not just a future thing, and eschatology is not just about the future. Uh, the word comes from eschatos, or eschaton, meaning uh, the last thing. Last things. Eschatology is the doctrine of last things. It is not, by that, the doctrine of future things, or the doctrine of the end. It includes that, but it's the doctrine of last things. When do the last days begin? When do the last days begin? Pentecost. Pen Pentecost. Pentecost, could be, yes. In these last days. Okay. Peter quoting Joel, but adding, right at the beginning, in these last days, in this eschatological age. We might say, with that, having read Malachi, when the Lord comes, when does the Lord come? In the incarnation, in the ministry of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is inaugurated in Jesus' ministry. This is the beginning of eschatology. You have been living in the eschatological age the whole of your life. You may not have been part of that until you became a Christian. Nevertheless, this is the reality for you and for the whole of creation. We live in these last days. And I want that to help you challenge the way you may think that eschatology is only a future thing that perhaps if you fall grave and yell, you need to start thinking about. Or if you see more storm clouds than California could possibly muster um, in the cloud and in the sky, then that's when you start thinking about it. No, this is a reality now. 
So I want us to uh, just observe that eschatology is uh, an already reality, not just future. Uh, heaven, if we think of heaven, occurs biblically throughout the scriptural narrative. It is not just a promise of what comes, up, comes after. So that God is the maker of heaven and earth. Jacob receives his vision of heaven. He sees a stairway, a, a ladder to heaven. Angels coming up and down because heaven is a reality. God is in this place, he said. I didn't know it. In Genesis 28. We have these visions of heaven as the dwelling place of God in Job, the beginning of Job. We have it when Solomon is dedicating the temple. That he knows that the temple cannot contain God. Heaven is his dwelling place. And yet God is gracious to be present. So that heaven means to us the presence of God. And this is why, of course, then, the eschatological, eschatological age, the last time's reality of God's coming is marked by Jesus' advent, his first coming, his incarnation. That's why if we say with Dr. Jungle, we are a new creation, we live this eschatological reality now. It is already true of us. So when does heaven happen for us? It happens now. Ephesians 1. We've had reference to Ephesians already this morning. Ephesians 1. Where is Christ? Christ is seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion about every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And where are we? Ephesians 2 tells us that we have been made alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, we are in heaven. This is wonderful good news. Heaven doesn't just happen to you when you die. Heaven is a reality now. Eschatology bears on you now. The reality of the coming presence of God that is true as the Spirit indwells us now. This is our eschatological reality. Don't conserve it to future speculation. So Jesus needs to shape our eschatology, both in the already, his presence to us, and in the not yet. Jesus is risen and ascended. How is Jesus risen and ascended? He is risen and ascended bodily. Yeah? So that Jesus, uh, from the grave, arises bodily, a transformed, a glorified body, but nevertheless, a human body. Perhaps we talked about this in Christology already yesterday. He ascends bodily to that weird moment where the disciples are just kind of a God looking up into heaven. Because Jesus' feet have disappeared through the clouds. It's really hard to find interesting art on the ascension. It's a pretty weird thing to try and depict. And his feet disappearing through the clouds. It looks a bit kitschy. But this is what happened. Jesus didn't just vaporize. The incarnation begins and never ends. Bodiliness is an eternal reality in God now in Jesus Christ and therefore for us. Which means that eschatology for us in the already and the not yet must affirm our bodiliness, how we live in our bodies, how we are indeed a temple of the Holy Spirit. That we anticipate glorified resurrection bodies, we have not got them yet, and Paul was very clear about this to the Corinthians, who might have thought they had. So 1 Corinthians 15, go read it and enjoy. Nevertheless, it is our hope that we have material reality ahead of us. Which is very interesting when you think that a lot of the popular conceptions of what heaven is like is about floating on a cloud and playing a harp dressed in white. Not many of you have chosen to dress all in white today. I say bits of white, they're not all in white. Um, when we conceive of heavenly reality now and our eschatology, our future hope, we can kind of, in a sense, evaporate the goodness of it, that it's good news, and say, well, it's, it's kind of good in a kind of you know, completely whitewashed kind of way. Um, and there are possible racist ways of doing that, by the way. 
and during our future as technology, it's going to include people like me. And nevertheless, what about floating on a cloud? You guys tried that recently? In the clouds, you can actually enter Dawson clouds today, so you can give it a go. Um, get up in a plane, jump out, sit on the cloud, try playing a harp while you're doing that. Okay? Um, you won't be playing for very long. Uh, and you might get that other kind of way in which we understand heaven. Okay? Uh, a lot sooner, be with Christ on your physical day. Because bodies don't float on clouds. They just don't. And if our eschatology is built around a, vi a vision of floating on a cloud, um, we've got a pretty disappointing thing to look forward to. In fact, it's probably the case we're not looking forward to that at all. Playing a harp for eternity. Anyone play the harp here? No. Who's looking forward to learning to then play for all eternity? No, not really. <laughs> That's okay. Worshipping God. Living with God, being indwelled by God, being in the presence of God for all eternity is something that we are already experiencing as we have eternal life now. And it gives us hope that in the goodness of the life that we by the power of the Spirit can experience even in this fallen reality, that it will be better, not worse or more vapid or ethereal or, well, I kind of have to get used to it. I mean, sin's both going to be tiring now. Um, <laughs> We need to understand the goodness of our materiality that is affirmed in the fact that eschatology is defined by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, in the presence of the Father, is fully God, fully man, fully embodied. So our material hope of reality matches on to the way in which we should live out our discipleship now. And all those things that Dr. John was talking about in terms of hospitality and all, maps on to precisely the banquet we are going to enjoy. And so we enjoy it even now as we are able. This, in a sense, can be thought of in terms of our citizenship. Okay, our citizenship. We know that Christ rules. One way, just if I get to this point, I'll bring up one more slide. One way to narrate visually the inauguration of the eschaton is in this kind of uh, dipty, dual panel painting. Jesus on the cross. That is judgment day. The judgment of God is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There is no more judgment apart from the judgment in Jesus Christ that is to come. And that's why it is precisely the reality that is born out on judgment day in the panel of the right. They belong together. A visually important way of discerning that Jesus, Jesus on the cross, and of course Jesus risen and ascended, defines what we say about Jesus in judgment. In the in-between, we still focus on the fact that we are what? We're citizens of heaven. This is what our eschatology tells us. Citizenship um, is important as we think through eschatology. That our citizenship is in heaven, again, it's not saying you are one day going to be in heaven. It's saying that's what defines your citizenship, as you are seated with Christ. In a spiritual metaphorical sense, then you live out that citizenship now, which is precisely what the Philippians did. As Paul writes them, they were a colony of Rome. They enjoyed Roman citizenship, or some of them did. They didn't have to travel to Rome. They didn't have to go live in Rome to have that citizenship. It was theirs for them then. Just as for me, living here, although I am a citizen okay, of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, that I belong to uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Okay, that, that's my belonging. Nevertheless, I can live out that citizenship here by refusing to eat Hershey's <laughs> and refusing to eat Cadbury's made in the US by Hershey's, but only eat Cadbury imported from the UK. Okay, that's how one way I can live out my citizenship. And yet at the same time, I don't drive on the left. Okay? Um, again, a shortcut to get to be with Jesus in heaven. Um, We live out our citizenship, our heavenly citizenship now. That's the eschatological reality. Okay? Now, I, I can insist on my Britishness. What this says more importantly is not actually about my Britishness at all, that I have to have a visa to be here, um, but rather, let's get that ugly mug off, um, but rather that you and I are citizens of heaven. 
the last day's reality is true of us now, which is why eschatology and the reality of the kingdom of heaven defines the reality of the church that we've already spoken about. So I'll move quickly on. Let me just note, um, as uh, Dr. Peters would like me to, um, someone like Augustine, if you like, and you guys get to read or may have done already, some of his city of God, wonderful book. I'm not, I don't, do you get to read the last kind of books? Um, I have wonderful depictions. Um, the church is that citizenship, that city on pilgrimage, but making good use of the material goods of the world on pilgrimage to the world to come. It has an end that is certain, that the story will be wrapped up. This is what eschatology tells us. And it's got wonderful stuff in there, Augustine, about uh, the fact that being in the image of Christ when you die in the resurrection body means that you can still be male and female, which is important to at least more, probably more than half the room here. Um, it's good news. In materiality, bodiless humanity is affirmed. Um, it doesn't mean like the Gnostics said that uh, the Gospel of Thomas in Mary has to become like Peter and become a man. No. The goodness that we experience now in its fullness is redeemed and restored. Which means that eschatology, of course, in its future orientation, cannot just be about a soul floating in a vapid space. It has to be restored goodness. What is good? Well, it's creation. It's pinnacle, humanity, and the Sabbath rest of enjoying that creation. So creation will be restored. This is what we hope for and what we live in the reality of now. So that the already eschatology funds the way, for example, that we care about one another and, for example, how we care for creation. How we care for material goods now. Not because we are bringing about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord that's now curiously split. This is the wonder of God's patience in his mission. That when he came, he did not come to solely exercise judgment, but he came in mercy. And as he does so, and then Jesus goes back into heaven and will come again. The day of the Lord, the judgment reality of that, is delayed. That's why, of course, the church is about mission and discipleship. We've already heard. This is an eschatological reality because that is the end. And that judgment day will come. So much so in the sense of how the the reality of your readiness of eschatology shapes how we live now. And you may have questions about what that could look like. Uh, question time again. Let me move to say something about uh, the not yetness of a personal eschatology. I've already referred to it. In a sense, the Old Testament hasn't got a lot to say about after death reality personally. Um, you go and sleep with your fathers, perhaps, and you end up in shale in the pit. Um, which is kind of shadowy and, and not very discreet. There's a little bit of late hope, uh, Daniel, uh, that you'll be raised from the dust and you'll shine like stars. Okay, this is resurrection stuff starting to come in. And it's in Jesus that we see this resurrection hope. That's why the Jews managed to contest resurrection in Jesus' day. The Sadducees say no, the Pharisees say yes. Jesus sides with the Pharisees. There will be resurrection. And yet resurrection is, of course, that last day reality. <laughs> Wonderfully anticipated in Jesus' resurrection, but not something that you and I enjoy now. Like, I am not in my glorified body. You look at me if I think you're a man and say, really? But it's true, I'm not. <laughs> this is not just fashionable hair, do It's the lack of hair. I'm sure the decision to shave again. Okay? It's not like I've been listening, I've been decorating at home and listening to adverts on um, a radio station that plays music from my era, um, which I won't name. <laughs> but it seems that I'm associated with truck drivers and uh, drinkers of what's their keys. Um, <laughs> and only the most interesting man in the world was a fiction that had his hair grow thicker uh, with age. Uh, sorry, that was a sidetrack. <laughs> Well, I suppose the point is that unlike the most interesting man in the world, um, we have a concrete hope of bodily restoration. Yes, we struggle in our bodies now. We experience mortality, but we will put on immortality. And yet that is our last day's reality. It is not yet come. So Paul says, in the light of that, when I die, well, of course I know my body goes to the ground and decomposes. 
and yet I go to be with Christ. My soul is with Christ. And this is an account, very briefly, of the intermediate state. That where Christ is in heaven, where the souls, as depicted in Revelation, are gathered round the throne crying out, How long? How long, Lord, before you bring your judgment and end the suffering, the persecution, the fallen reality of the world? We are part of that reality. When we die in Christ, we get to be with Christ. But the point is, if it's true then that we say we go to heaven when we die, because at the basic, I tell my students this in my theology class, the answer in all theology classes is Jesus. If we want to be with Jesus. The point is that heaven isn't where we end up. Okay? So if you think your eschatology is basically solved with I go to heaven when I die, um, then the Bible's got news for you. Okay? Jesus doesn't stay there. And so I'd rather stay with Jesus than hang around in heaven. Because Jesus comes back. He comes down. And we want to be with him as he comes down. Um, in, yeah, in class, I've not got time for this week, for uh, the classic uh, rapture passage from 1 Thessalonians 4. When it looks to us that rapture is an upward, moment, uh, upward motion, we are caught up to meet Christ in the air, in the clouds. Okay, so we think it's all about upward motion. But of course the main point of that passage as we read it more fully, you can go away and read this up, is that Christ is coming down. And there's no indication that he's about to turn around and go anywhere else. He's coming down to earth because this is what the conquering, victorious king does in bringing his judgment. He comes into the city. And as he's approaching, the people come out to greet him in his triumphal entry. Oh, this reminds us of something, doesn't it? This reminds us that Jesus did exactly this. Paradoxically on the donkey, paradoxically ending up in the cross, but precisely that triumphal entry that gives us Palm Sunday, which the people knew how to celebrate, not because they were wanting to give us Palm Sunday in the future, but because that's just what you did. Going out to greet the conquering king, you usher him in. And so our hope is that Jesus will return. And we will usher him in. And our hope Biblically is Jesus will physically return to material reality to restore all things by by judgment. Judgment, again, biblically for us, must be something that we experience and hope for as good news. Because I suspect in, in all sorts of senses, certainly probably in our cultural context, the word judgment is entirely negative. We think of judgment as condemnation. And yet judgment scripturally is, yes, about God bringing down the mighty, the arrogant, those who oppose him. Yet it is also about lifting up the poor, the weak, the fatherless, the widow, giving hope to the hungry, food to the hungry, Water for those who thirst. This is the reality of judgment, setting things to right. So the good, the good story that we live in the marred reality of creation is restored to its goodness. Not as a return to Eden, but as the arrival of the fullness of God's goodness for his creation. The full purpose of it, its full sociality. Part of how that uh, judgment gets looked at um, and described can be shown in this, uh, we'll just have a little visual break again, in this visual depiction. I love this, uh, I love this piece of art. Um, what's going on here? What do you see in this picture? Let's just visually execute it. Natural harmony. Okay, so the, the, the painting is um, called the Peaceable Kingdom. Um, specifically, okay, um, there's someone else. What do you see? A lion. A lion, and a lamb. You need to guess that with your eyes closed, um, given that we're in a theology class. Um, well, a whole lot more than that, and uh, let's just hear from Scripture again. Isaiah 11. Uh, and you just, you just look at this picture, it's just beautiful. Um, Isaiah 11. 
that believers are taken into the fully restored new heavens, new earth. That's why I prefer that people talk about new creation or new heavens, new earth than just heaven because of the way we kind of vaporize that reality. And that for those who do not confess Jesus Christ, there is hell. There is consequence. There is an end and a judgment. This is important for an account of the moral good of God's purposes in creation. That as judge, he is precisely loving as he has been in Jesus Christ. And that affirms both the terribleness of sin that must be punished and the mercy that is offered us in Jesus Christ that we hold on to. So lastly, some comments on uh, precisely the new heaven and new earth, uh, because I think it's uh, exciting just to uh, close up on this and I'll give you some time for questions. Things that we, uh, as I'm looking this up, things that we haven't talked about. Specifically, I've mentioned Christ can return at any time. We've not spoken about signs of the coming of the age. Um, you might want to ask about that, the imminence of Christ's coming. Um, nevertheless, there's enough in Scripture to tell us He's coming like a thief in the night. He will come at any time. You do not know the times. Um, so that what we do in eschatology isn't about just speculation about dates. It's about certainty and assurance and confidence in the light of difficulty. And we don't know what's happening in the next week, but we do know that God will institute his judgment because he's already done that in Jesus Christ and Christ will come again, just as he went. And what does he come again to, uh, to institute? Well, the pictures that we have in Revelation 21 and 22 are precisely new heaven and new earth, are, are delightful. I commend them to you for for your meditation. I commend to you the, the materiality. But they bring a pearly gate. Gates made of pearl. The important point is not so that you get lots of jokes about Peter at the pearly gate. The point is that, wow, gate made of pearl. It's a wonderful affirmation of God's material created goodness. Streets of gold. And that's not just a popular vision of getting rich quick. It's a, a, an affirmation of God's goodness. There's no temple in the city, for it's the temple, and for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. There's no sun or moon to shine in, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. And so the lights will, by its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. This to me speaks of a continuity from present creation in its fallenness, as it's restored into new creation. So that just as Christians, as they are judged, may bring their deeds and their ministries and come through as gold or silver, or indeed have that work burnt up as fire, and have an account of different reward in heaven, not for jealousy, but just for material reality, as God judges. But then so the nations bring their glory, as their kings bring in and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Could that mean the glories of our art, the glories of our cultural undertaking? Perhaps so. There's security. One of the things that we hold on to in our eschatology is the security. Heaven, the new heavens, new earth, new creation, it is fully secure. And this is demonstrated in the picture of the new Jerusalem because the gate is never closed. Why? Because there's no night. There's no time of danger. That's when you close the city gate. When there's threat, there is now no more threat. That's a wonderful depiction. You and I in new heaven reality and our glorified bodies can enjoy our sociality peaceably without any threat, secured by God and His act of ultimate judgment so that we may live in a context of no more death, no more pain, no more sin. And of course there is, in Revelation 22, the river of the water of life flowing through the river to the middle of the street. Okay, it's not a return to a garden, but there's a garden city. There's been a no design a garden city movement. Well, they're just kind of getting a little bit close to the reality of New Jerusalem. And there's a tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. Precisely what is affirmed as the Holy Spirit indwells us and enables us each in our own language to understand and to live out Christian discipleship so as the nations bring their glory, so as the nations are healed, our identities are affirmed in our own distinctiveness now, in a transformed reality, so that we can look forward to not a bland white heaven, 
but a multicultural, multicolored, multilingual, delightful, and yet fully socialized without the communication problems that come with Babel. We can look forward to that in the new heavens and new earth. What does that look like? Gosh, that's hard to depict. So it's a delight that God has given for us. It's circumscribed. It doesn't tell us everything. But we can look forward to this as a reality because of what we confess scripturally. That Jesus Christ will come again in judgment and that that is good news. Good news for us now that we can live in the light of that future judgment because we already experience it in Him and good news for our future that we don't need to speculate and worry about dates but can live in a full understanding of the joy of the goodness that is to come. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.